Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today, we're talking remotely with Dr. Joshua Arbach. Dr. Arbach is the Chief of Spine Surgery in the Department of Orthopedics at Bronx Lebanon Hospital Center and an Assistant Professor of Surgery at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx, New York. Dr. Arbach attended medical school at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. From there, he completed an orthopedic surgery residency at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. He completed a spinal reconstructive fellowship at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Arbach. Thank you for having me. Well, Dr. Arbach, I want to thank you today for joining us on eOrthopod TV Remote. And what I thought we would discuss today is a condition that I think you're probably very familiar with, and that's spinal stenosis or lumbar spinal stenosis. So first, can you, can you start out by talking a little bit about what spinal stenosis is so that patients can understand what we're going to be talking about? So spinal stenosis is basically a condition of your low back where the nerves that are exiting the spinal canal are being pressed. And when the nerves are being pressed, whether it's from arthritis or from a disc herniation, then those nerves that are being pressed can cause pain that goes down your buttock and into your leg. And the kind of other kind of symptoms that you can have when a nerve is compressed as it exits the spine can be numbness and tingling and difficulty with walking. And you may notice that you're walking shorter and shorter distances. This may also be accompanied by low back pain as well. These symptoms together are basically called um, neurogenic claudication. In other words, the nerves that are being pressed cause this, this triad of pain, numbness, and tingling that can be very, very disabling and troubling for patients. Now, what about danger in terms of the signals that might um, drive me to come and see a spine surgeon? Uh, is this something that I can decide when and if I want to pursue this, or are there certain things I should be watching as a patient that should tip me off that it's time to see someone like you? Well, most cases of spinal stenosis are able to be treated non-operatively. I mean, the vast majority of patients are uh, will typically have complaints of low back pain with the leg burning and numbness and tingling, and usually it can be fairly well tolerated with medications, and sometimes we'll get patients started in a round of physical therapy, uh, and usually with some of these more conservative treatments, the symptoms can be, for the most part, controlled. The time to be concerned and uh, maybe to see your doctor a little bit more urgently is if you start to develop weakness in your legs or an inability to bring your foot forward or difficulty with walking to the point that it's really interfering with your quality of life and, uh, and certainly any, any sort of change in your ability to hold your urine or hold your uh, feces, uh, certainly those could represent uh, more significant and more severe compression of the nerve roots uh, and that would certainly uh, indicate that you, you should see um, your doctor much more urgently. Now let's talk a little bit about the evaluation of, of spinal stenosis. Um, when I come to your office as a patient, uh, what's the first thing that, that you're going to do during that visit? Well, the very first thing that we do, we always sit down and we get a really good history. Spinal stenosis is a very, very common condition. It affects millions of patients per year and it's the most common reason for older patients to seek out spinal surgery care. So the most important thing is to get a really thorough and detailed history to understand what brings the pain on, what makes it better, and what are the associated findings. So for example, if a patient comes in and, and they describe a pretty clear history of, well, I used to be able to walk five or six blocks uh, without having any pain, and now over the past few months or so, it, I've been only able to about, walk about one or two blocks or so before I have to stop. And I, in fact, I've even gotten a cane. And some patients will come in with... Um, with the canes that have a seat on them because they know they can't walk for long distances before having to stop, that's a pretty clear picture of a progressive spinal stenosis. These Again, these patients will also complain of numbness, burning, tingling, and associated low back pain. So the spectrum of, uh, of disease uh, that spinal stenosis en encompasses is, uh, is fairly, um, fairly clear, and, and you can usually uh, get a lot of information from the patient just by taking a really detailed and careful history. Now the other things that we'll do in addition to taking a good history and just talking with the patient is to do a physical examination. So on physical examination, the most important thing I do, I actually watch the patient walk, not just walk you know, from the chair into the room, but 
we'll go out into the hallway and I'll, I'll watch them walk up and down to sort of see what kind of balance um, stability do they have. Are they favoring one leg or the other? Are they pitched forward? Uh, is there um, other, is maybe there's a problem with the hip. Maybe there's a problem with the foot or the ankle. These are all things that um, orthopedic surgeons really, it's really important as orthopedic surgeons to evaluate a patient's gait from the from top to bottom. We can't just be, as a spine surgeon, we can't just look at their back. Um, we have to be thinking about possible hip pathology, knee pathology, foot and ankle disease, balance problems. Maybe maybe their walking is a, a balance problem is related to a cervical spine problem or pressure in the spinal cord, which is a totally different kind of a problem. So for me, the most important thing and the first evaluation that I do on a physical exam is to watch the patient walk and to really get a good sense of where is their discomfort coming from, if you're able to tell so from the walk. The other things uh, that we'll do, in addition to the uh, watching uh, and evaluating their gait, is we'll do a strength examination, and we'll see, make sure that all the nerve roots are firing strongly and that there's no weakness. And we do a sensation examination, and we also always check the hips, make sure that there's no hip arthritis, and we'll look at the range of motion of the hips and at the knees. We also do examinations of the pelvis to make sure that there's no arthritis in the sacroiliac joint because this can also mask as back pain that could also potentially be causing leg pain as well. And we always check the pulses as well because we want to make sure that patients that have back pain and leg pain and weakness and difficulty with walking, sometimes these patients may have vascular claudication or perhaps they have peripheral vascular disease, in which case their leg fatigue and tiredness is not actually coming from the spine nerve roots being compressed, but perhaps it's coming from vascular insufficiency or a peripheral vascular disease. So all these things are all come together in the, in the history and the physical examination so that at the end of the day we can come up with a good idea of where the patient's discomfort's coming from. Well, I'm, I'm particularly glad that you went into the detail about the vascular claudication and the difference because this is sometimes confusing not only to primary care physicians but, but also patients and, and even some other specialists. I think that the, the problem that we as orthopedists always face is is we see a, a condition that we think is an orthopedic condition, it's not always the case that it is. It can be coming from the spine, and as you point out, it can be coming from the blood vessel disease, it can be coming from another part of the, the musculoskeletal system like the hip. So I, I'm, I'm very uh, glad that you went in and explained that very well for patients. I think that's a, 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 sometimes a very difficult thing for patients to, to really understand. Sure. What's the first radiologic test or or some type of scan that you would typically order? All right. Well, uh, you know, what I'll commonly do, in fact, if a patient's history is fairly suggestive and fairly clear that the problem is, in fact, coming from the spine and that it is a spinal stenosis-related problem, in most cases, unless there's a red flag, unless I'm concerned about unexpected weight loss or some sort of, or maybe there's, uh, you know, signs or symptoms suggestive of a, a AAA or an aneurysm, or infection or a fracture. In most cases of back pain uh, with associated leg and buttock pain that I believe is consistent with spinal stenosis and neurogenic claudication, very commonly we'll go ahead and just get them started in a conservative treatment program, even before the imaging is done. So if this is a patient that's never sought out medical treatment for this problem, you know, if, if they've come in and they've already done a bunch of physical therapy and medications and things and other other sorts of treatment, then we, we would jump to the imaging studies. But if a patient's just coming on for the first time and being evaluated, most likely we'll get them started in a round of physical therapy and try different medications and those sorts of things. And in the vast majority of symptoms, excuse me, in the vast majority of patients, we get those symptoms under control and don't need any further imaging or workup. But if they've gone through these imaging studies, sorry, if they've gone through this initial round of treatment, whether it be with medications or rest, anti-inflammatory medications, muscle relaxants, pain medications, if they've already gone through this first round of treatment, then the first step I'll do is go ahead and get an x-ray, a lumbar spine x-ray, and typically we'll get a lumbar spine flexion extension x-ray as well. And what that x-ray shows us is it shows us the architecture of the spine and of the vertebral bodies. And we want to, what we want to see is what is the alignment of the spine? We know that as we get older, we tend to lose our normal natural curvature of the spine, which is called lordosis, and we tend to get a little bit more straight and a little bit more kyphotic, uh, which again means that the spine itself is straight and it can actually reverse into the opposite curvature. And some of that's due to arthritis-related changes and some of it's due to loss of height of the discs 
And as we get older, we know that the discs shrink a little bit and lose the water and lose their supportive cushioning. So the first step is we'll look at the sagittal alignment of the x-ray. We also look for uh, whether or not there's a presence of a fracture. And we also may want to look and see if there's something called a spondylolisthesis, which is where the two vertebral bodies may have a, a sense of instability, where one vertebral body is slipping in front of the other. These are very important um, uh, hallmark findings of spinal stenosis and the, the spectrum of spinal stenosis, which includes spondylolisthesis. So these are really important um, things to note on the x-ray to help us figure out what's the next treatment step. And do you go ahead and start treatment uh, based on, on x-rays? Do you, do you feel the need to go to any further more advanced imaging, or is this usually enough for you to, um, to make plans for treatment? Well, I think once the screening x-ray is done, again, once we've either ruled out that, you know, again, that there's no fracture, there's no uh, other, you know, uh, large structural problem that could be causing the symptoms, then most likely we're going to go to an MRI. So an MRI of the lumbar spine is a magnet where the patient lies flat on the tube and they're in a, in a magnet for about 30 to 45 minutes. And the, the images that are captured by the MRI machine allow us to see in two different planes where the nerves could potentially be pinched. And based on the source and the location and the degree of nerve compression, uh, if there is nerve compression, then we're able to dictate our treatment accordingly and, and either recommend either a surgery or injections or continued uh, physical therapy and medical management. Now you've mentioned physical therapy and you've also mentioned medications as a part of the treatment plan. Can you give us a little bit of uh, information about what you're expecting from physical therapy and also what type of medications that you're going to prescribe? Sure. The first line treatment for uh, medical management of spinal stenosis again, is typically Motrin, ibuprofen, other anti-inflammatory agents, uh, most of which um, do a really good job for first-line treatment. Uh, those patients that have more back-related symptoms than leg-related symptoms, they may benefit from a muscle relaxant like a flexoral or some other sort of muscle relaxant. Uh, the second uh, medication that we typically recommend is a nerve medication, either Neurontin or Lyrica both of which help calm the inflammation around the nerve roots. And in more in patients with more severe pain, sometimes we have to go to narcotics, such as a Percocet or Vicodin or Tylenol, Codeine, and some of these more stronger medications where the patient's pain really is quite severe and disabling. And in, uh, in those cases, we do have to use these stronger agents. And what about physical therapy? What are you hoping to gain with physical therapy? So physical therapy really can help a lot of different patients in a lot of different ways. What we typically prescribe is a program of core strengthening, where we really work on strengthening the patient's core muscles on the belly side of things, and also working on strengthening their back muscles. Uh, one of the other great things that the physical therapists are able to do is to work on um, pain modalities. They can provide heat, ice, ultrasound, electrical stimulation. Um, and then the other thing is we can just get them on the treadmill and get them walking and to, uh, and to you know, help them with their gait. And sometimes we'll end up prescribing, at the recommendation of the physical therapist, we may end up prescribing a cane or even, in more severe cases, a walker, um, depending on the level of severity of their disease. But with the, the main goals of physical therapy are really to provide pain relief and to help restore functionality and to really get them walking to the level that they uh, uh, require and uh, are hoping to achieve. Now let's talk a little bit about injections. You had mentioned injections as part of a little bit more invasive uh, treatment for spinal stenosis. What type of injections are we talking about? And again, what are you trying to achieve with those injections? Right. So again, if you remember, the source of patient's buttock and leg pain from spinal stenosis is a pressed nerve. Again, that nerve can either be pressed from arthritis in the spine or from a disc herniation pinching on those nerves. So the ways that we try to alleviate those symptoms are, again, either with the medications or potentially with the physical therapy. And with the injections, what we're trying to do is try to calm the inflammation down. Now, there are two main routes through which the, medic through the, which the injection can provide patient symptom relief. The first example is an interlaminar epidural steroid injection where the pain management physician provides a needle into the interlaminar space and provides medication which goes down the entire fecal sac. And that will help calm the inflammation down around any of those nerves that are being pinched. 
The second type of injection is called a transforaminal injection. This is a little bit more selective. This is where the pain management physician uses a fluoroscopy or an intraoperative x-ray to localize the exact site on the nerve root where that where the medication is injected. So if the physician thinks that the L3-4 nerve root on the right side, for example, is the pinched nerve that's causing the patient's symptoms, we can selectively inject a medication around that nerve root, which again should help provide a, a strong dose of, of, um, of helping medication right onto the affected nerve root, as opposed to an interlaminar injection where it may be more dissipated and may have a lesser effect. So um, the transforaminal injections are a little bit more precise, and perhaps they can provide more medication to the affected nerve root, but they don't get the global effect that an interlaminar injection can have, which does sort of help all the nerve roots in the distal lumbar spine. Now, if I'm a patient, what should I expect from these injections? Is this something that I get once? Do I get it multiple times? And, and how long can I expect these to help when I do have an injection? Well, that's something that a patient's going to have to discuss with their pain management physician because a lot of docs have a different or have their own protocols that seem to work best. Um, sometimes an injection will be provided one time in order to assess whether or not the patient's going to be provided any relief. Sometimes they're provided a series of three injections or even more. Uh, and again, that's all very uh, uh, practitioner specific. But what a patient can expect from this, again, whether it's one injection or a series of injections over time, is that if the nerve is being pressed, if the medication is provided to this nerve, the patient can expect almost immediate pain relief. Again, sometimes even within the hour, and hopefully we, this pain relief would be for as short a period of hours, but sometimes it can last even up to months. And certainly there are patients that, that, um, that get a lot of injections and uh, are doing everything they can to try and avoid a surgery, which also, again, if they can get their symptoms under control, is a very reasonable option to do. Um, so again, the, it's hard to predict who will get that extended and long-lasting relief from an injection, but we do expect that in most, most patients they'll get some form of pain relief, whether it be hours or days or weeks to months. That's really more on a case-by-case -case basis, and it's hard to predict ahead of time. Well, as a spinal surgeon, when do you, si when do you decide that, that conservative care has failed and it's time to have a discussion about surgery with the patient? Well. Spinal stenosis is a very, very disabling disease in some patients. But most importantly, and one thing I always tell my patients is to, that they need to know that it's usually not a life-threatening condition and it's, and it's not a uh, surgical emergency. So we always try to exhaust conservative treatment modalities to the best of our abilities, which again includes doing nothing, medications, physical therapy, and epidural injections, or repeating that sequence if, uh, if, if that's what's warranted. And really we let the patient decide when the conservative treatment has failed. If a patient's pain continues to persist despite these conservative treatment modalities, and certainly if the patient's pain is getting worse in the presence of these conservative treatment modalities, and, and certainly if the patient should develop any more concerning signs or symptoms, such as a foot drop, or weakness, or change in their urinary or, um, or their bowel or bladder habits. This obviously represents a progression of their neurological signs and uh, their neurological disease and may warrant a surgical decompression more urgently. So we try these conservative treatment modalities, but if the patient's pain per continues and it's severe and disabling, then we typically recommend a surgical treatment. If we get the patient's pain from an 8 out of 10 down to about a 4 out of 10 or a 5 out of 10, and it's not getting any better, but the patient's okay with that and doesn't really wish to pursue a surgery, then by all means, that's a very, very reasonable uh, choice. We don't have to do a surgery if the conservative treatment doesn't bring their pain down to zero. What we want is for the patient to be able to live their life comfortably, to be able to do the activities of daily living that, that bring them joy to their li in their lives, and... Um, and really the surgery is reserved for those patients for whom the conservative treatment has not worked and for whom the spinal stenosis is causing severe and disabling pain that's interfering with their quality of life. Once it gets to that point, and again, that's not a decision that any surgeon can make, that's a, really a patient-specific um, uh, outcome. Um, at that point, the surgeon and the patient have, have a discussion and say, listen, this is where you are, this is what we've tried, and now we need to discuss what are our options. We either continue on uh, with these conservative treatments or we can start discussing 
possible surgical options. And let's talk a, a little bit about those surgical options. When I'm a patient who's, who's suffering from spinal stenosis, uh, what are you going to recommend in terms of a, spi of a surgical operation that could help alleviate those symptoms? When it comes to discussing surgical options for a patient, there are several components of a potential surgical intervention that need to be discussed. The first component and the requisite component of any surgery for spinal stenosis is a decompression. So whether it's an indirect decompression with a less invasive procedure like an X stop, or if it's a direct decompression where you're performing either a laminectomy or bilateral laminotomies where you're preserving the posterior ligamentous structures, either way, the goal of that surgery is to take the pressure off of the nerve roots. The most effective way to do that is to perform a direct decompression where we're, again, removing either the arthritis or the disc tissue that's pressing on the nerve root so that after the surgery, the nerve root is no longer being pressed, which should alleviate the patient's buttock and leg symptoms. So that's the primary goal of almost any spinal stenosis surgery is either a laminectomy or a laminotomy in order to decompress the spinal nerves. Now, whether or not a patient also requires some form of stabilization, i.e. a spinal fusion, is really up to um, what the x-rays and what the MRI look like. If there is instability in the spine, meaning a spondylolisthesis, or again, like we discussed earlier, where two of the vertebral bodies are unstable and one may be slipping forward in front of another, that is very commonly a situation that requires a surgical stabilization with a lumbar fusion. And the reason why we need to do a fusion in this situation is because we know that if we just do the decompression and take the pressure off the nerve roots, that the vertebral body may continue to slip forward and cause persistent back pain and leg pain, possibly leading to another surgery down the road. So the most efficient and effective way to provide great patient relief from both their back pain and their leg pain is to decompress the spinal nerve roots with the decompression and then again depending on if there is any instability to may, maybe also adding a stabilization procedure such as a lumbar spinal fusion. Well, Dr. Arbach, I look forward to further discussions on this topic. I think we've given patients a great amount to think about, and I, I would like to explore with you at a later date some of the, the intricacies of surgery that, that are the, the type of surgeries that are, are required to treat this disease. But at this point, I think you've given patients an excellent um, basis for understanding spinal stenosis. If I'm a patient with this disorder, is there anything else that you think I should be asking my physician about my treatment options at this point? I think the most important thing for patients with spinal stenosis is to just is to understand and to really open the dialogue with the surgeon uh, or with their treating physician to just make sure that all the options are discussed. Uh, because there's a, there's a lot of options that patients have that can be beneficial that don't need a surgery. Um, if a patient has symptoms for two or three months and they haven't had a chance to get any better with epidurals or haven't had a chance to do physical therapy, it's understandable that a patient can say, Doc, I just want to get fixed. I just want to get better. This is really, really bothersome. But I think patients need to understand that this disease is, although it doesn't go away um, from a radiographic standpoint, once you have spinal stenosis, uh, usually the stenosis itself doesn't get better radiographically, but the patient's symptoms can actually get a lot better. So once you get the symptoms, it's not that the symptoms will never get better. So when a patient is having severe pain, sometimes they're coming in really wanting to get the surgery and just to get things over with and get their life back. And I, I always try to ask patients to be cautious and to be conservative and to be patient because a lot of times, you know, Mother Nature will sort of take care of some of this on their own. And just with a little bit of tincture of, tincture of time and medications and just being a little bit ginger with your back and, and over time with some physical therapy and then plus or minus the epidurals, a lot of patients will get better and they won't end up needing a surgery. So I ask patients to be, to be patient and to be cautious and to really explore all the options with their treating physicians so that they don't rush into anything that you can't undo and that you understand the natural history of spinal stenosis, which is one of progression, but it doesn't. you usually don't see a significant and rapid deterioration in one's neurological status. So I ask patients to be patient and conservative 
explore all the options with their surgeon and together come up with a, with a treatment plan that, that really makes sense for, for the patient. Well, I think that's both good advice and encouraging for patients. So I want to thank you for that and uh, look forward to further discussions in the future. Thanks a lot. Thank you for having me.